I work in Rwanda where in one year we could increase the yield by putting this together. It's a small, all of these villagers, we put this center pivot system and we could increase the yield by 30 times, 30 times. That's pretty significant. And I could see it with my own eyes. All of a sudden, within a year when I went back, the mud hut will... <laughs> tearing down and become concrete and modern houses because people were producing so much more. For those of you out there that are truck guys, like me, I want to talk to you about one of our newest sponsors, Dect. If you don't know Dect, they make bomb-proof drawer systems to keep your gear organized and safely locked away in the back of your truck. Clothes, rifles, packs, kill kits can all get organized and at the ready so you don't get to your hunting spot and waste time trying to find stuff. We all know that guy, don't be that guy. They also have a line of storage cases that fit perfectly in the drawers. We use them for organizing ammunition, knives, glassing equipment, extra clothing, and camping stuff. You can get a two-drawer system for all dimensions of full-size truck beds, or a single-drawer system that fits mid-size truck beds. And, maybe best of all, they're all made in the USA. So, get decked and get after it. Check them out at decked.com. Shipping is always free. Sitting in Hermiston, Oregon this morning with Mr. Fred Ziari. And we are going to talk about a few different subjects. But what we're going to start talking about is irrigation. This is something that affects every single person on the planet unequivocally irrigation affects everybody and the history of irrigation is truly fascinating and i'm curious fred where did it start where do you think the first group of people or civilization was that thought i'm going to move some water to get this plant to grow yeah well thank you so much it's an honor to be with you uh, james um Really, you have to go back thousands of years. There were really three major civilizations, what we call them hydraulic civilization, because they found a way to use water in an effective way. And as a result of that, they became a big civilization and a big empire. And there are the Roman the Egyptian, and the Persian. The Roman use of water was through what we call aqueduct, where they determined and figured out from very, really high-level engineering how to go to a mountain, like, you know, 100 miles away, build this elevated aqueduct, bring the water all the way to the cities uh, and serve their water from so you bring water from mountain which was a high rainfall area and you brought it to the dry area overland you could still go to rome and see the aqueduct going right into Colosseum. you can see the arches and so on and they were very effective. Uh, as a matter of fact, they have a very luxurious uh, living, swimming and fountains and so on. Probably one of the first truly opulent societies in history. It was. It was, you know, they have entertainment and um, they had fun. Yeah. <laughs> Those Roman, because of that water, uh, they figuring out how to use water. How important was concrete? in in their their ability to create the infrastructure to be able to reduce grade so that they can move that water. Yeah, this is I, I'm a I'm an agricultural engineer. My specialty is irrigation engineering. 
when I visited there, I, I was just dumbfounded. No engineer can go to Italy and not be humbled by their engineering. I mean, it's just amazing. So all of these civilizations, they had also a great engineers uh, that made it combine uh, their engineering uh, and the growth of their civilization. Yeah, concrete and use of arches, especially arches, how to put things over, over land or elevated, mm -hmm. maybe 30, 40 feet, and bring the water. That was pretty amazing. The Persian was another, which I, I am a Persian. Mm -hmm. and I was born in um, northern Iran, right along the Caspian Sea. And as a matter of fact, my last name, Ziari, means people from the village of Ziar. And it's interesting, I moved to the um, United States when I was 18 years old, and that was 52 years ago, so you know I'm 70. It was amazing when I came to Eastern Oregon, you know, many, many decades ago, almost 40, 50 years ago, Farmers were bragging about that they are uh, they were from uh, their fourth generation farmer, and they were mm -hmm. wagging their finger at me. I said, Am I supposed to be really impressed with that? So damn right, there aren't that many fourth generation farmers. I, said, I beg to differ, because my family been farming in the same place for about a thousand years <laughs> that we know of. The the Persian found the opposite of what the Roman did. They developed what we call, they would go to the mountain again, where there was high, a high level of water and rainfall. And then they went down like 100 feet shaft, and they would dig a canal underground for hundreds of miles. And they come to a city or a village, and that technology is called kanat. Um, I, uh, I have a question about this yeah. because I, I feel like I might have intimate first-hand experience with this in Afghanistan. Yes. They called it the Karez there. Yes. The uh, Afghanis are also Persian. Right. And, and we're, in, were influenced by Alexander. and, and yeah, other, Correct. Yeah. Well, we, we taught Alexander everything he knew because <laughs> he didn't want to leave <laughs> Iran. When he got to Iran, he said, oh, this is it. Why am I going back to Greece? I love it here, and they, they, his generals and all of that were at arm. He married an Iranian um, uh, queen, and he just didn't want to leave because of all of the civilization he was uh, exposed to. But and yeah. Alexander the Great was a tremendous student. I think that Correct. was that was one of one of his, you know, most underrated strengths. So when you say that. You taught him. You very much did. <laughs> I, I don't know. We all learn from each other. Uh, you know, we are one really global community. No, nobody has one leg over the others. But yeah. That's my feeling. But we are all learning from really the past, which comes to our future, came to the future, which is now. That Karez system had a tremendous impact on on warfare in southern Afghanistan, especially yes. in, the, in the Helmand province. So these these underground aqueducts, if, yeah. that's, if that's a fair way to, to call them, called the Karez, a lot of them had fallen in. So if you go to Google Earth and you look at mm -hmm. uh, the Helmand province of Afghanistan, you'll see all these dots in the ground. That is right. And that's exactly what they are. And they restricted troop movements in a really significant ah, way. This is really interesting. They, they, were, they controlled all, our lives. The Karez controlled our lives in Afghanistan more than the enemy did. Wow. Um, it, and it, it's something that I've never heard talked about outside of the troops who were there until now. Huh. And, uh, yeah, truly amazing. So keep yeah. going. Yeah. I mean, the Kanat, uh, or if you want to say it in Farsi, if there's any Persian, uh, listeners, Kanat, that's how they say it, which is used in that part of the world. It is underground aqueduct or canal. It goes, you know, 50 miles, 100 miles. But the, so the beauty of that is there is zero evaporation. The water is always, when it comes, is very, very cold. Mm -hmm. 
and because it's not exposed to the atmosphere, it is very clean because it's purified. Um, but the amazing part of it, how do you go underground with certain slope for 100 miles so when you come out on the, when the water comes to a town, it is on the surface or maybe five, 10 feet below surface or, you know, that was the engineering marvel. And there are very detailed study of it, how they did surveying. They would do underground, you know, they would have shaft every maybe 500 feet or 1,000 feet. And that's why you see from Google Earth, you can go and see it. And most people will say, well, how come there is <laughs> all this line and mm -hmm. you see a mound every uh, thousand feet? Those are all can cannot. Uh, and this is maybe 3,000 years ago? But they started a long time ago. I don't know exactly, yeah. but thousands of years uh, they've been using it. And because of that, you know, that's what part of their, um, you know, that's why they lasted all these years, and they became, you know, at one point, the Persian were the largest empire on the planet. Mm -hmm. um, kind of, they are the Roman and Greece, and at some point, the Persian. The, the Egyptian, again, that's the third leg of the hydraulic civilization is the Egyptian, right, um, which really developed the technology of floodplain. They would go to Nile, I've been there many times, and they would, when they, they allow the water to, when it rise, then it would, uh, during summer, it would go down, then they would use that as an irrigation and irrigated field. But they also developed the, what we call the Many different, using animals to lift water from the Nile. They use manpower. I mean, you could go still see many, many innovations that they did. How to raise the water from the Nile, bring it 10, 20 feet into the surface and develop irrigation system. And, and, and this is so important that the metric of horsepower today is based on how much effort it takes to lift a certain amount of water over a certain period of time. Correct. Yeah. Correct. You know, and uh, majority of time we use gravity with a little bit of lift. Um, that's why the the aqueduct in, in uh, old Roman uh, Empire and the uh, the aqueduct underground aqueduct in Persian Empire were more more or less using gravity. Uh, to, uh, and that's why I come back to why today is so different. Right. Uh, because we don't have to depend on, on gravity. We're fighting gravity now. As a matter of fact, water if, in most areas, if you come to eastern Oregon, uh, which is um, one of the most productive farmland in the world, is that we learn to that the water moves upward <laughs> by use of pumps and the new technology we can move water massive mm -hmm. um, many many miles hundreds of miles away and that's um, what the new technology but um, the Egyptian the, you know uh, we all read it in our history but they all played a role and it came back to to what we call um, era of uh, England or Great Britain, which kind of developed that technology of water in a massive way. In back in uh, 1600, 1700, and they developed the water wheel and how to, and also put the steam engine using water, steam engine, put it in, a sh in their um, big vessels or warship that could travel many really fast. And they took that title of uh, leader of the water civilization. And the Dutch did the same thing. They knew how to use water. The Six Ranch Podcast is brought to you by Nick's Handmade Boots, a family-owned company in Spokane, Washington. This year, Nick's is celebrating its 60th anniversary of making leather boots for hardworking men and women in America. 
I recently visited their factory where their owner, Shiler Moe, walked me through the boot making process from start to finish. As a rancher myself, it was a rewarding experience for me to see, feel, and smell the high quality leathers processed in hundred year old tanneries throughout America. This leather is cut, sewn, lasted, and sold by skilled craftsmen before ending up on the feet of folks ready for a hard day of honest work. I've been wearing Nick's Game Breakers on the Sixth Ranch as I work cattle, plant my garden, build fence, and prepare for the upcoming hunting season. Nick's has a full assortment of men's and women's work boots for wildland firefighting, trades, tactical, and western pursuits, as well as heritage boots for anyone who values quality and craftsmanship in their everyday life. Visit nicksboots.com to find your next pair of high-quality American-made work boots. Use the code 6RANCH, that's the number 6 in the word ranch, to receive a free leather work belt with any purchase. And water has so many tremendous properties, so many tremendous properties, but it's about 800 times denser than air. Oh, right. And steam, to my understanding, is an expansion of about 1,600 times greater than, than liquid water. So the energy potential there is incredible when you add heat to it. Absolutely. Water is, you know, so, uh, I always believe most of the time that when the, we have so much of anything, it becomes invisible. Air is invisible to us. Water is invisible to us. Sometimes if you live in a forested area, yeah. you know, forests become invisible. We don't, I mean, literally don't see it. Sometimes, if you live in a poverty, poverty becomes, hunger becomes invisible if you have too much of it. Mm. And um, water is one of those unique chemicals that most people take it for granted. But again, um, I think it's one of the most amazing substances that we have um, that really sustain life on planet Earth. It takes so many forms, you know, solid and liquid and gases and, you know, it's yeah. just amazing. I'm, I'm glad that you use the word chemical to describe water because it cracks me up sometimes when people will say things like, well, I don't like any chemicals on my food. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I don't yeah. think that word means what you think it means. Yeah, no, yeah. I think chemical is a correct uh, word for water and... Um, People like us that we make our living in water is uh, we we know how all the phases of water and how to use it really to benefit. Can water become a plasma? I don't know. I don't either. I never. I'm still at it, I'm still trying to wrap my mind around plasma. I d I never got a clean understanding of that one. But, but that that's an aside. But uh, but you know it was about late 1800. The French were building, I believe, building Panama Canal, and they were failing miserably, mm. where the United States came and took it over and said, this is how it's done. And we built the Panama Canal, and right after that, we built the largest dam system, which is the Hoover Dam in 1930s. We took the mantle of the new hydraulic civilization. From 1900 to almost 1960s, we built one hydro project, hydropower, hydro reservoirs, canals, whatever it is, one of them per day for over 60 years, 70 years, straight. And as a result of that, we change America, where we used to be uh, almost in the late 1800, like 50, 60 percent of us were working in the farm. We became so in the starting in 1970s, and to this date, we became like 98 percent were not involved. Only two percent were involved in feeding us, because of all the amazing infrastructure we built. And then 98%, we freed them to go develop um, America in technology and technological advancement and medicine and you, you name it. 
what made America great is because we unleashed those human potential to go not worry about their food because 2% of us today is almost 1.8% of us as a farmer are really feeding not only America, but also the rest of the world. So Microsoft and Google of the world and all the other advancement in technology, there is a reason it happens in the US. And it didn't happen in China. As a matter of fact, China's Achilles heel is still to this date is water. And they're late to the game and they, they are doing something, but they still have a tremendous amount of water deficit that they have not met. And where we are fully, we are fully hydraulically connected, you know. So if you live in Los Angeles or California, we bring water for thousands of miles into California. And so the same thing if you come to eastern Washington, you know, hundreds and hundreds of miles of canal and water and pipeline and so on. Bring water from Columbia River, for example, or, and distributing it to millions of acres of land in both in Idaho, Washington State, Oregon. That is the new way we have developed, and it helped uh, America to become America, in my opinion, because it is, uh, we are, became so productive, especially in the area of irrigation and how we can feed people. And, and even in addition to that, we take hydropower from Eastern Oregon and we can send that energy to California so that they can take that water and make it move uphill once it's there, right? Correct. <laughs> you know, again, this is, I, 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 um, you know, in my professional life, uh, I develop this large scale irrigation project in the U.S. and throughout the world. We've done work in over 35 different countries. I mean, I have a map of it. There's a beautiful map here in the, in this boardroom here, and uh, this is probably you know 12 feet by 12 feet. And I see stickers all over of the places yeah. where you've done water projects. Yeah, I've been all over in Africa, Central America, Russia, uh, Ukraine, you know, and, um, North America, all over Brazil. And, and we develop really large scale project. You know, we don't maybe five, 10,000 to 100,000 acre projects that we get involved and we develop the engineering design and oversee the construction of it. And we also provide all the related brand new uh, modern technology to make it very, very efficient. And, and that's really important because if you look at it from irrigation perspective, we have an, an irrigation efficiency around the world of 30% efficiency. How do you define efficiency in this I mean, regard? You know, if I take um, 100 gallons or 100 liters of water and I use 30 liters and the other 70 liter goes to waste, <laughs> that's the efficiency. I understand. But if you come to like eastern Oregon or eastern Washington, our irrigation efficiencies and how we do it, how we manage it, um, is, is exceeds 95, is 95, 96% efficiency. So probably the most efficient system in the world is right here. Um, I love and that. And we have uh, people from all over the world, we come and we, I really enjoy sharing, you know, what we learn with the rest of the world and less sort of, and the reason that is important is that there is about um, is a population is a big issue that most people most nations don't pay attention they give lip service the same way with water they give lip service like United States we haven't developed any water project uh, last 
30, 40 years, 50 years. We just stopped. We developed all of that. We got to a point that we are, you know, pretty comfortable with our food and water and so on, but we stopped. I believe that's not right, for, especially for America. We need to continue development of water and water project, and there need to be a, a great collaboration between the state as the agencies and the farming communities and community at large. We, we cannot stop. We've got to go forward. The reason is we are adding somewhere around 300 thousand people a day are born, right? Every day, babies. There is, you know, let's say 100,000 people die or something like that. And there is a net increase of between, let's say, 80 million new people have to be, are born every year, net. Whose responsibility is to feed that many people? And where do we feed that many people? Where at the same time, every single day, we have about 50,000 people are dying of starvation every single day. For some people that are compassionate, like I am, I think that's really important. We need to do our utmost to feed our fellow human beings. And our rate of hunger is increasing every minute. Every minute is increasing because of this population explosion. We are at 8.1 or 8.2 billion people. In 2010, we were 7 billion. In 2000, we were 6 billion. That's, that's a billion people per decade. Who's going to feed it? Whose responsibility is it? And that's, is that the farmers need to do it? Maybe. Yeah. But when the farmer go and talk to their state or talk to their federal agency, very little support. Oh, let's, let's do this together. And whenever we start talking about numbers like a billion, it, it's almost impossible to conceptualize. So I, I try to break that down for people a little bit in a way that maybe they can understand it. So <laughs> if uh, a billion is, is a thousand million, right? So if we go to the Grand Canyon to its deepest point, and you were to take a stack of dimes and yeah. go from the bottom to the top, that would be one million. Yeah. So you'd need one million stacks of dimes from the bottom of the Grand Canyon to the top of the Grand Canyon to reach one billion. So this is a huge number. This Correct. is a massive number. Correct. Yeah. And it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, I've been talking about the hunger issues, our responsibility as a, citizen and the farming community because especially with the irrigated agriculture you can let's say if you want to feed a million people which is in a week we add a million people to the world's population in a week if you leave it to the world standard you need roughly it would feed one person per acre so you need a million new acres a week. <laughs> so you need over 50 million new, acre, million new acres if you use the traditional farming. And an acre is the size of a football field with both end zones. Correct. So that's how much land every single one of those million people require. Correct. And then how much water but, is needed. But, but if you now, if you take that, instead of depending on... This is on a, what we call with no irrigation. But if you come, like we have right around where I am, we have over 200,000 acres of irrigated agriculture. And we grow some 50 different varieties of food, which is really very diverse amount of food that we raise. And that 200,000 can feed about 10 million people, so about 50 person per acre. Okay. So all of a sudden, from one acre to 50 acre, or from one acre to some area, 30 or 20 or 30, you could really increase productivity. 
like in one acre of land, here, we grow lots of potatoes. We grow about 40 tons of potato in a 200 by 200 feet, roughly an acre. 40 tons of potato can be grown with a really modern technology, irrigated agriculture, efficient way of doing it, 40 tons, sometime more. That's a lots of food. That's a lots of calories uh, that you can, you can feed the world. I think um, at, at the end, depending on no rain, agriculture will not be sufficient. We need to fully develop our irrigated agriculture, use it in areas that we can. For example, in eastern Oregon, where I am, there, we have a massive, you know, the second largest uh, river in the U.S. You know, first is Missouri River, uh, Mississippi. The second largest is Columbia River. Mm -hmm. In the state of Oregon, we use about three-tenths of one percent of Columbia River. That's all. It's so massive, and we use very little. And for the last 30 years, we have not been allowed to take any water out of the river for whatever reason, environmental reason, and so on. But I think it's a pretty good deal. Like, you take very small amount of water, and you can feed from three-tenths of a percent, 10 million people. That's a pretty good deal. And that should be global model on how we should feed people and uh, use water efficiently, as I said, over 95% efficiency. That's amazing. A lot of the, the irrigation that occurs in this area comes from center pivots. Correct. And center pivots, for, for those who don't know, are a circular pipe that, that uses arch technology <coughs> that, that moves around in a, in a circle in a field and has hoses that drop out of the main line and then has a sprinkler at the bottom that, that dispenses a set amount of water. They're, they're really incredible technology because at the outside of the pivot, of course, it's moving much, much faster, faster. than the inside of the cool. pivot. So you need to manage the, the amount of pressure as it goes through there and have sprinkler heads that are dispensing water in, you know, in different sizes and frequencies. Um, you know, the folks at, at Nelson Irrigation Correct. have done a, a, a truly <clears throat> incredible job of developing that sprinkler technology to increase that efficiency. Something that concerns me, Fred, are some of the pivots in areas where they're drawing water out of aquifers Correct. and those aquifers are dropping. And that's of concern to, to lots of people. You know, we look at water levels and like the Ogallala aquifer oh. that are, that are dropping in, in the, in the aquifer in Southern Idaho. Um, and then some of these closed basins like we have in, in Southeast Oregon where they're not necessarily refilling. So when we look at moving into a future with, you know, adding this, this population of humans that needs to consume more food that needs to have more water put on it. How, how do we manage all of this? Like, is, is the future bleak? Is, is it hopeful? No, that's why, that's why I said sometime, really, it takes a collaboration of what we call society and farming community together, in collaboration together. We need to address this together. There is no togetherness right now. Right. Anyway. Yeah. You know, um, in the U.S., farmers are, uh, you know, they, they do whatever they do, and, or whenever we try to go and talk to our state agencies, and um, you know, it's just like a Soviet style, nyet, nyet, nyet. It's not as what we farmers want. They just want to say, hey, you know, we have, a, we have a issues, we need to feed people, that's, we feel responsible for it, and we need to collaborate together, but do it the most efficient way, and we know, again, we have a global model, which is in eastern Oregon, eastern Washington. It's a global model of efficiency. Let's just replicate that throughout the world. As I mentioned earlier, 
the global irrigation efficiencies is 30%. Let's get them from 30% to 70% or 80%. You mentioned about right. the center pivot. They are readily available and it should be used in a lot of the global communities. We know how to do it. We know it, we need to work with them. As I said, we work in over 30, 35 countries and we really show them how to do it the most efficient way. There are, there are things, so we can, we can really do th something to increase productivity with the use of proper amount of water. Every, we have like, if you come here in this 200,000 acre, we have close to 3,000 sensors, real-time sensors that measure soil moisture and it, can, it goes through the satellite and it goes through our farmer's iPhone they can see it in real time, where, where is the water, and then we make a recommendation to them when to irrigate, how much to irrigate, how many hours to irrigate. I mean, really what we call precise amount of water needs to be applied, precise amount of fertilizer, don't overdo, don't abuse it, because over, if you have a choice of over irrigation or under irrigation, you're better off. You get more crops from under irrigation than over irrigation. So proper use of water, if you apply it the same way, it's just like you can't expect a person to drink uh, 10 gallon of water or you know, uh, 50 liter of water a day, we, we die. <laughs> so you can't put too much water to a crop because they die. You know, they need oxygen in their soil and you put too much, it just avoid um, uh, all the oxygen is out of the way, and the crop almost wilt with too much water. So there are big amount of technologies that are available to our communities in the U.S. and throughout the world that really can make increased productivity by Minimum of 2x, 5x, 10x. You know, I work in Rwanda where in one year we could increase the yield by putting this together. It's a small, all of these villagers, we put this center pivot system and we could increase the yield by 30 times. 30 times. That's pretty significant. And I could see it with my own eyes. All of a sudden, within a year when I went back, the mud hut will... <laughs> tearing down and become concrete and modern houses because people were producing so much more. But there are big, big technology that we really know how to use technology to conserve. For example, you said the aquifer, Ogallala aquifer. We've been promoting a concept called aquifer recharge, mm -hmm. or sometimes it's called aquifer recharge or aquifer ASR, aquifer storage and recovery. There are two different uh, technologies. Which is like a scaled up version of the Kerez. Yeah, yeah. But this one, for example, uh, Ogallala or you go to Missouri River, every year it floods. During those times, we really need to take those water, which is in excess, and filter it, and, which is really not that hard, and put it back into the ground. Some areas doing it, we've been doing it successfully in eastern Oregon for the last 30, 40 years, where the water level came up by uh, hundreds of feet. <laughs> and uh, sometimes we call it fully recovered, where you know, it was going down, down, down. Now, using this, we are um, really are recovering through this aquifer recharge. There's tremendous amount of potential for this everywhere in the U.S. But it does need um, the collaboration of regulators and re regulators that are really try to work with you. Um, yeah, lots of time you bring these ideas, any technology. The first thing they do, especially in North America, they knock it down. There's all kinds of problems with it. But, mm -hmm. you know, problems are to be solved. And we can do it together, but in collaboration. But um, you mentioned something about Grand Canyon and how many a billion is. I, I do see the same problem when, when we say, and I said it, you know, like 
40, 50,000 people die of starvation every day, most people cannot relate. And I don't know how to make it. I can come up with any fancy word to say it or fancy statistic to say it. You talk about a baby dying, or your baby, or your cousin, or you, somebody you know, people can relate to it right away. That's not fair. Right. But 40, 50,000 people, that goes over people's head. They almost disassociate themselves because that's too much, too much pain to even understand that. But that's real. Right. One, one right? death is a tragedy, a million is a statistic. The same thing when, when you consider water. Six billion out of 8.2 billion people on the planet don't have access to safe drinking water. Mm. Six billion. Lots of them drink raw water, and I've seen it with my own eyes everywhere I go around the world. It's just like, you know, and anybody travels to Africa or even in the U.S., we are not immune from dirty water. But there are issues. We need to address it. There are, you know, there are technology. As a matter of fact, I have some new technology that I'm going to unveil to hopefully this is going to solve, has a global impact on how make water more available, which would be another podcast. Yes. Look forward to that. Okay. So with this, with this hunger issue, if we were to, to go west of here to Portland um, and, and, you know, grab a random person off the street, say, you know, do you care more about, uh, about salmon recovery in the Columbia River or about irrigation in the Columbia Basin? there's a good chance that they would say that they care more about salmon recovery. I believe that if you took that same person and, and you took away their next seven meals, right? Mm -hmm. Seven, seven of the meals they're planning on having, they don't get to have. And then you come back and you say, do you care more about uh, salmon recovery or do you care more about food? Yeah. Right. Which is directly, directly related to irrigation, I think that their, their values would have changed in that very short time period. Correct. Okay, so now we're going to move, move into hunger. When did you realize the hunger crisis that's occurring in Oregon? So on the hunger issue, um, I, I don't know who said this, but I really like this quote. He who has bread has many problems. He has, who has no bread has only one problem. Mm. Right? Hunger is a horrible thing, horrible thing, uh, that we still have not been able to face it straight on. One of those things so prevalent, it becomes invisible to you. It maybe become numb to it. I don't know what the name is. About uh, 16 years ago, um, I, I went to a meeting in southeast Portland and I sat in a group of people and they were talking something very strange to me and they were talking that how Oregon is, if any of you haven't been to Oregon is the most beautiful state on the planet bar none it's just Beautiful people, beautiful scenery, just tranquil. The weather is good. Everything is good. And in that meeting, in two, it was January. I, I wrote the date because it was very significant to me that I learned that Oregon, state of Oregon, this most beautiful state, was the hungriest state in the United States at that year. And not only that, They've been in that position for decades, for decades. That rate of hunger was tremendous, and still to this day, it is tremendous in our state. During that meeting, somebody mentioned an experience they had with uh, Mother Teresa, where he met, he was our ambassador to United Nations, met Mother Teresa in, in, uh, in uh, Calcutta, India. 
And it was just bringing all these babies, you know, she would bless them. Maybe most of them would die. Maybe she saved one or two of them. And he was, our ambassador was really moved by it. And he says, you know, I represent the greatest country. What can I do for you? And Mother Teresa said this, which I never forget. He said, do what is in front of you. Do what is in front of you. Lots of time, we, that means, oh, we got to go to Africa. We got to go here. We got to do this. We got to do that. But what I was learned that night, that Oregon was one of the hungriest states. And I was driving back to eastern Oregon that night. And that thought, if you go outside of my, uh, my office, there is a big, big thing, big poster. It said, do what is in front of you. And that's it whole thing about our company is, you know, uh, don't, don't look for a solution elsewhere. Right, it's right in front of you. So from the next day, that night, I made a really crude PowerPoint presentation about what I learned. And I had almost two to three months of daily meeting with uh, my farmer friends in Eastern Oregon. And I asked them two things. One, did you know that the state that you were born and your fathers were born, your ancestors were born, and you are one of the large farmers, is the hungriest state in the, in the United States? And every single one said, <laughs> we had no idea. We never heard that before. And second question I had, would you dedicate a small portion, not big amount of land, so we can purposefully plant food for hunger relief. Not, you know, the, before that it was all, you know, we cannot sell it in our grocery stores or give it to the poor or uh, food are going back, let's give it to the <laughs> hungry, which is not, you know, really sustainable. We wanted to develop something sustainable. And based on that initial meeting, every single one of our farmers said, yes, Let's do it. This is a great idea. And that's where we formed this organization called Farmers Ending Hunger. And you can go check it out, farmersendinghunger.com. And, uh, and it's purposeful planting. I don't think anybody else has done it this way. It's purposeful planting of food for hunger. And that means you go, we went to the Oregon Food Bank or food agencies throughout the state, so what is your need? I said, our need is not to be overwhelmed with so much food at the end of harvest. We need food every month, so many of them every month. So, oh, okay. So, based on that, we formed um, um, this organization, and uh, we uh, also had a board of director form. So, I give you some example. One farm will give us, give us 30 tons of potato. That's a lots of potato. Every single month. At the end of the month, there is a 30 tons of potato. Goes to, for 12 months out of the year, goes to uh, Portland, Oregon Food Bank. And then from there, it is distributed to all of Oregon and also Southwest Washington. Another farmer gives us 20 to 25 tons of onion. I have to recognize my friend uh, Bob Hale. He used to be the original owner of it. He just passed away a year ago. But he was so generous. 20, 25 tons of uh, onion every month. Another farm gives us 30 cows. Just right here, a few miles from me, they give us 30 cows per month, every month. And they've done it for two decades almost. Every month, 20 cows. We take it, we slaughter it, and we turn it into quarter pound hamburger. And we distribute 500,000 of quarter pound hamburger to people that need it. Another thing is some of the farmers give us wheat 
and we turned the wheat into pancake mix, enough for five million pancakes, and we distributed. Another farmer in Hood River gave us hundreds of thousands of pounds of amazing cherries. Right now, they're picking cherries, and they distribute this for people, watermelon and beans and peas and everything on a monthly basis. So we give about our organization about five million pound of products that we give. It doesn't tax any one of our farmers too much. <laughs> Even during really high prices, they could have said no to us. But some some of the farms, you know, that's worth hundred, two hundred thousand dollar to them. It's not inexpensive, but they do it. And that's where you, your example of going to downtown, you know, salmon is a food source, and I value salmon because we de- need more of them. <laughs> but you were making an example of hunger. We don't need to make this choice. Uh, I always said that agriculture is our business. Farmers, you know, this is our business. But food is everybody's business. So we need to change. We change our language mm. from agriculture to food. And everybody wants to collaborate and cooperate. We have uh, lots of partners that uh, give um, and help out. All of the food is free. Um, What's the name of this program? It's called Farmers Ending Hunger. And you, and you, you started this. Yeah, I started it in 2000. That day, right after I heard the, <laughs> the message that we need to do something what is in front of us, that was in front of me, and I... They're there, they're still going very strong. They're very proud of it. Our farmers, really, are so generous. All you need, sometimes, and they, <laughs> it was a, interesting. You know, the way I presented it was, hey, you know, if you need a haircut, you go to barber shop. Which I, as you can see me. I don't need to. <laughs> I don't need to go barber shop. If you need uh, shoes, you go to shoe store. How come, if you need food, how come you don't go to a farmer and ask them to help, ask them to be involved? And they are. I mean, it wasn't that hard. It's just asking the right question and asking them to help. And they were very generous. They still are. Could be throughout all of our United States and other countries. We could do this. This is not, you know, don't take it from one person. Ask them to contribute and ask, we really also figured out how to do the supply chains and all of that. We had a really amazing board of directors that were big businessmen, and uh, let's do that. You have to figure out the logistics machine behind this. With with margins being so low oftentimes yeah. in agriculture, is there a way for them to offset the, the cost of this? As a matter of fact, the uh, majority of our farmers say we don't want any subsidies. As a matter of fact, we will pull out. Because that, that that's again, goes back to community base. This mm-hmm. is our problem. It's not government's problem. Mm. We should, you know, we should be generous. And that's what, you know, it's our fellow American, it's fellow Oregonian. It's not the strangers. No, I don't think anybody expect any money back. We do need some funding to transport. Right. Transportation is, um, and sometimes packaging it. Like, you know, we got to be bagging it and freezing it or put it in a, you know, sh- shelf life that is a life, has a long life. All of our product is free. We don't need any money. Farmers are given plenty of food. Some people want to, Contribute uh, or help out, go farmers ending hunger. And is a is a program we call Adopt an Acre. You know, you can adopt an acre or a quarter of an acre that feed twenty people, or one acre again, you know, can feed so many people. And uh, depending on what your generosity and your heart tells you, you can uh, you know adopt an acre or a half an acre or a quarter of an acre. How much does and it cost to I adopt mean, an acre? I think it would adopt an acre. An acre would be about four or $500, something like that. Okay. Or you can do a quarter of an acre for 40 bucks or 50 bucks. All right. It doesn't po- matter. All right, <laughs> podcast listeners. Uh, 
we're we're going to uh, we're going to adopt at least an acre during this show. So if you go to the show notes in the podcast description, you're going to see a link, and you can go directly to that link. And uh, I'm going to price match the first $100, um, as I always do with these fundraisers. And uh, Six Ranch Podcast is, is going to adopt at least an acre here, and we'll see if we can do more. Oh, that's very generous. Thank you, James. This is, and, this and, is what, <laughs> what it's all about. Yeah. You know, we, are not in, we, don't, we don't really fundraise for the sake of fundraising. We don't have any overhead. So it's all the food goes to the people that need it the most. And the needs, again, anybody in America or around the world, especially last few years because of the upheaval we have in Russia and Ukraine and the whole thing has been messed up, the price and, you know, some of the inflation issues we have, um, I'm, again, I'm not political, but the, everybody feels the price of food, you know, is really high. People have choices to make, you know, shelters, education, getting to work, and so on. But a lot of time, the food becomes sacrificed uh, because there's just nothing left. Food, and water, and shelter is what it comes down to. Yeah. Ul- yeah ultimately. Basic, basic yeah. thing. So thank you so much. for. Well, I, I mean, it's, it, it's amazing. Um, it, it's an amazing problem. I think that it will always be a problem, but it is something that we can work on. Something that's come up in the past when we talk about water shortages, which do occur, Correct. Uh, is that we're surrounded by ocean. Like, um, and I, I've, I've heard it said that we don't have a water problem, we've got a salt problem. <laughs> uh, can, you, can you break that down a little bit more? I mean, there's a lots of countries that use, um, you know, ocean to, as a... As a source of their fresh water. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, is a, it is a doable thing. We need to promote more research in that area. Very little goes on. You know, it's more the whole reverse osmosis <laughs> that we did. You know, expensive, you know, mainly energy-rich countries use that more. Because it takes a lot of energy, right? It takes right? a lot of energy. But I am convinced of this. Again, we came up, you know, I have a startup company, started three years ago, you know, we came up very novel way of um, producing water very inexpensively, probably the most inexpensive way, but that's uh, later to be discussed. Um, Are you doing that with the atmosphere? Well, you know, we do it different ways, you yeah. know, really our technology is based on nanotechnologies and... Um, but also, I, I am convinced, if any of you haven't used AI for your work or your business, I really encourage you to take that. I think AI will be an amazing leaps and bound in how we develop technologies. We have used lots of universities. They are this that sense of urgency for me is not there. I, I'm gonna do research. Uh, just decades, you know, going. I said, you know, that's not acceptable. If we have those sense of urgency, we need to re- really get serious about water and producing more food and producing, uh, especially on the water issue, uh, drinking water issue. We just gotta blow it up. And some of them traditional. Uh, water resource development, building storage. We hardly build any storage in the United States right. anymore. And the minute you mention it, you know, there's all kind of barrier put in front of you. Again, it's just a, like what we talked about agriculture. You know, we, we used to talk about agriculture, we got to do that. We change our language about food. Now, lots of people outside of agriculture want to talk about food and how they can help like we just did, right? The same thing with water, um, water development. You know, we need to change our language about, hey, we're going to do this. We're going to, let's talk about solving problem for our fellow man, for a human being. And the way to do it, we got to carry our weight in the United States. We can do more to produce more food. We can be more generous in 
doing thing to relieve water, um, uh, bring our high level of technology to the rest of the world in how to do, maybe desalinization is one of them, but there is all range of technology that we could do it today. It's just not acceptable to drink. I mean, I saw people drinking just raw sewage water or raw water from creek where they wash their cows and their animals and they, you know, it's dirty and most of them get sick and uh, that's why most of them are young kids that get sick uh, in sanitary. Lots of them die every day. Is there anything we can be doing to cool water? Cool water? Yeah. <laughs> it's right underneath us, right, right underneath our fo- feet, right? You can put the water, again, that's part of that recharge we talked about. You can put the water right underneath it. Like here, you go 10, 20 feet, the the earth is about 50 degrees. You want to cool it, you know, just put it 10 feet and bring it up maybe. I, I don't know. There are, again, we need to get creativity of um, engineers and scientists to pay attention to this, we could, we could solve it. I really believe these are not, whether it's energy, whether it's water, whether it's agriculture and feeding. Again, that's where my interest is. I hope people pay attention to it because that's a basic human need. We could really focus and bring the world's attention to these things it doesn't need to be always our government doing it. They just need to enable people with their creativity to do it. I think we could do go a lot further, but don't get on people's way. Because lots of times technologies that are really viable, they die because of regulation and over-regulation. And, and I'm not saying don't remove all regulation. we got to have a sane thing, but you know, you got to put it in perspective. When the people are dying of thirst, 99.99999% is good enough. Where here, you know, because of our technology and sensor, we can measure purity to <laughs> billionth of a part per million. I mean, it used to be part per thousand, part per million, and now it's part per billion. Ah, you know, sometimes you got to see it in perspective that um, we are, you know, we are good enough. Yeah. Uh, and if we can dig a an underground water tunnel system yeah. in Afghanistan and throughout Persia 3,000 years ago, <laughs> 3, years. I'm pretty sure that we can figure out how to take uh, water in the Columbia, divert it, use that natural cooling of the ground, yeah. put it back in the river and cool this thing down. Yeah. And that is going to be a really positive thing for the fish, for the Pacific Ocean. Absolutely. Yeah. So, and, and again, uh, we are blessed to have um, men and women that are working on the fish issue because that's a food source, right? And it's important for our environment. And it's important, yeah. you know, uh, and we are more and more aware of it. But So we don't need to fight over this thing. Again, if we can figure out a way, you know, look at our politics, you know, it's always confrontational, Mm -hmm. always confrontational, where, you know, it's just, okay, a problem is presented, what's to confront about? Let's find a reasonable solution to that problem, rather than uh, you're, you know, we call him <laughs> names and get upset and all of that. And I think that's lack of uh, civility, but more than, and our leader should be exemplar of how we should really solve our common problem. A lot of the confrontation that Americans deal with today is confrontation without uh, any implication. Correct. So we can have these arguments that superficially feel, you know, very confrontational, very adversarial, but nothing comes of it. Uh, it you know, it, it's static. It's just noise. Yeah. And, uh, and it's not fulfilling. Yeah. No. It's a lot more fulfilling. No, the needle doesn't to, move. And everybody can do it, really. Yeah. In your communities, if you're whatever your communities you are, you're doing, 
You don't need to do big things. Lots of time we get so shocked by the system that we got to do all of these big things. We got to do the reverse is true. We got to do a lots of small things. It really will have an impact uh, if we, as a citizen, uh, <laughs> again, you know, I wasn't born here in this country, but uh, I was converted to this country. And like all convert, I'm zealous about hmm. America. I yeah. really am. I, I love everything about it with all of the ups and downs. But we Americans are very, very generous people. We develop so much stuff and we readily from from technologies to medicine to science and whatever, and we just fr freely give it away to the benefit of mankind. And that's the way I see it, and we need to really, America and American need to work a little bit more, pay attention to some of these basic stuff, which is food and shelter and how we, and water and air. So my challenge to people is to try to find that thing that, right now is invisible to you yeah and notice that it's in front of you and do something about it and just like you said it doesn't have to be a big thing it, yeah. it can be a small thing but if, if if a lot of people do a small thing that's pretty big okay. it's pretty big what are some other ways that people can can support your your efforts in ending hunger i would say um um Ending hunger, it, you know, we need to have, again, the r rural area and the urban centers need to come together, form an alliance. Like last week, we had a big gathering. People came from Portland and the big cities to our eastern Oregon town. Uh, it was a program called, uh, uh, it's an economic development uh, by Eastern Oregon Women Coalition. Mm -hmm. All of our daughters and wives, and um, uh, they all really very active on how to promote economy. Mm -hmm. Lots of time, guys used to do it, but now they've done an amazing job. I was really pleased, um, especially our mothers, you know, and our daughters and so on. They should be a big part of this solution when it comes to hunger because that they, they are the ones that feeding our kids uh, most of the day. Um, uh, but, I mean, it's just like uh, getting the, especially the urban centers and the rural centers, people working in the big cities, reach out. Call any farmers. How do we work together? And we are trying to reach out the same way to Portland or two Seattle or two bigger cities. How do we work together? There's all kind of noise, right? But some of the solution, again, especially in the hunger issue, in my opinion, nobody with all of these hundreds of millions of acres of farmland we have, nobody should go hungry in the U.S. None. Zero. We should have zero tolerance for it. There's no reason. But, you know, it's just focusing is what we need. Collaboration is what we need. Um, really solving problems together is what we need. And the government and agencies need to help and enhance that um, together. I, I completely agree with you. And for the, for the folks in the urban centers, I really want you to take this advice and give it a try. And I'll, I'll use... I'll use myself in the Six Ranch as an example. We rebuilt two and a half miles of river going through the ranch to make it slower, to make it deeper, to make it ideal habitat for trout, salmon, and steelhead. We gave up some of our most critical grazing land in order to do this. Yeah. What we need in order to continue doing these types of things is for people to buy our product, right? right. So if you buy the beef or the produce or the eggs or the or the lamb or the wool or whatever that comes off of a off of a ranch that's doing this type of thing or off of a farm that's trying to do something like this, 
then that's how you are supporting this positive, sustainable food system. You know, the water, water in rivers tends to get warmer as it goes downstream. Yeah. When the water flows into my place, it is warmer than when it leaves. So we, we, we fight against the natural physics of, of rivers and we're actually able to cool it off with the way that that river works. Um, please do reach out to these places and find ways to support them and then find ways to, to continue that support in areas that are, that are closer to you still. Um, so, so important. Um, other ways that they can follow along in, in what IRZ is doing. Oh, yeah. Um, so my company, IRZ Engineering and Consulting, as I said, we, we are a um, design, build, and manage. We provide engineering design for this very efficient irrigation system, pumps and big pipes and uh, this center pivot or drip irrigation and how to put them together. Again, this is a larger scale. And um, and also we provide water management services. So we do quite a bit of uh, work on having the sensors in all of the field uh, and these sensors measure soil moisture. We also measure uh, soil fertility and all of this data comes and the weather, we have like 80 weather stations just around this area in eastern Oregon, just a Hermiston area, where all of this data comes in and we turn it into crop models for like 50 different crops, a potato and a wheat and a corn. And all of these crops use different amount of water on a daily basis. You know, they're different. So we model it and we measure it also by soil moisture sensors, and then we provide that to the farmers as a way to really what we call precision irrigation. Apply water precisely, don't put too much and don't put too little. We tell them how many hours to run their sprinklers, how many inches to put it in. So it is uh, something to marvel, and that's why we see the highest yield of any crop in the United States happens right here in uh, her, what we call Umatilla, Morrow County, or Columbia Basin of Oregon and Washington. Highest producer of any crop by many, many factors. Um, like a potato that is grown in Africa, they would yield maybe... 10, 12 tons, and we can get 40 tons or 45 tons. It's a big, significant difference because of the level of technology we use. Um, automation is another big thing. Uh, all of our farms are fully automated. It means we can turn our, you know, doesn't matter, 10,000 acre, I can turn hundreds of valves on and off just using my iPhone. Um, put just a small amount of fert fertility or fertilizer through water so it is not what we call spoon feeding. Just a small amount, I can turn it on and off. I measure the soil fertility and I say, okay, this is how much water and fertility you need. So this is a good balance, very efficient way to farm and irrigate, and um, so it's a kind of a marvel. I'm very proud of uh, our accomplishment. We just, uh, on May 7th, we just celebrated our 40th anniversary of our, uh, our company, IRZ Engineering. Congratulations. Yeah, that's a pretty big achievement. For a, yes, it is. For a dude from uh, Persia, Iran, coming here in Eastern Oregon, they they treated me extremely well and i'm proud to be here well shukran uh yeah. thank you for your time uh thank you for the everything that you're doing and i'm i'm hope, hopeful that uh that this this podcast community can uh, can come together and, and help support what you're doing and, and work on work on the thing that's in front of us right now yes thank you so much uh, thank you very much thank you sir bye everybody 
I just want to take a second and thank everyone who's written a review, who has sent mail, who has sent emails, who has sent messages. Your support is incredible. And I also love running into you at trade shows and events and just out on the hillside when we're hunting. I think that that's fantastic. I hope you guys keep adventuring as hard and as often as you can. Art for the Six Ranch podcast was created by John Chatelain and was digitized by Celia Harlander. Original music was written and performed by Justin Hay, and the Six Ranch podcast is now produced by Six Ranch Media. Thank you all so much for your continued support of the show, and I look forward to next week when we can bring you a brand new episode.